Almighty God, our, our Heavenly Father, Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor, in thought and word and deed, through the negligence, through weakness, through, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past. And grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the comment for today. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, we may run the way of your commandments and win the crown of everlasting joy 
Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going now to hear our first reading. Thank you, John. Our first reading is taken from Exodus, chapter 31, verses 1 to 14. Just hold on, we're not on. Yeah. Oh, we've got one more one? Yeah. Can't hear. Oh. Our first reading is taken from Exodus, chapter 31, verses 1 to 14. The Lord spoke to Moses, See, I have called by name Basal, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with divine spirit, with ability, intelligence, and knowledge in every kind of craft, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood in every kind of craft. Moreover, I have appointed him with Ohalabab, son of Asakmak, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given skill to all the skillful, so that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting and the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat that is on it and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and the utensils, and the pure lampstand with all its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin with its stand, and the finely worked vestments, the holy vestments for the priest Aaron, and the vestments of his son, for the service of priests, and the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense for the holy place. They shall do just as I have commanded you. The Lord said to Moses, You yourself are to speak to the Israelites. You shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it shall be cut off from among the people. This is the word of the Lord. And unfortunately, I'm not quite sure why, but that was the wrong chapter. So I don't know, well, uh, chapter 32, but it's fine, we've had a bonus bit of Exodus, so I'm now going to read from chapter 32. The sad thing about it, Joan, is if, if you had read chapter 32, you wouldn't have had all those horrible names to deal with. <laughs> but never mind, never mind. So this is Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mould, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. 
They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you like to stand for the gospel? Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet." But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. The slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I was really torn this week as to which of our readings to focus on. And I seriously considered looking at the Gospel reading on the basis that I could begin by talking about the COVID-19 guidance to continue to keep our buildings well ventilated even as we go into the cooler months because I wanted to be able to tell you that I hoped that though many would be cold, few would be frozen. (laughs) But I decided to talk about the Exodus reading instead. Our journey through the book of Exodus in recent weeks has put me rather in mind of a roller coaster full of twists and turns and sudden stomach-wrenching drops. And this week's reading definitely comes into the category of a stomach lurching drop. In the past few weeks, we've traveled with the Israelites from their slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea and out into the wilderness, 
We've looked on as they've grumbled and complained about the lack of food and water and seen God provide for them at every turn. And in the previous few chapters, things have seemed to reach a bit of a plateau. God has called Moses into his presence at the top of Mount Sinai and imparted the Ten Commandments and a series of detailed instructions on how the Israelites should live and how they should relate to God, some of which we heard in that um, passage that Joan read for us. And at the beginning of chapter 24 we read, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And at that point, we start to think that maybe things are okay, that their relationship with the Lord has moved into a new phase of stability. But we should really know better than to relax, because just as a roller coaster on a plateau is usually a precursor to a sudden turn or drop, so nothing really prepares us for the events of chapter 32. So just before this chapter, Moses has gone back up the mountain to talk to God some more. He's been gone for quite some time. God kept him waiting on the mountain for six days before calling him into his presence. And then the Lord had rather a lot to say to Moses. And in the meantime, the people at the bottom of the mountain are getting the collie wobbles. Moses has been gone for so long that they decide he's not actually going to come back. Perhaps this god on the mountain has eaten him alive or struck him down with a bolt of lightning. And so they take matters into their own hands. Our text said that they gathered around Aaron, Moses' second in command. But a better translation of the Hebrew is that they gathered against Aaron. There's that element of conflict in the original Hebrew. And that would go at least some way towards explaining why Aaron seems to just give in to what they ask for. He doesn't seem to make any effort to try to reassure them that Moses will be back or to tell them that what they're asking for is a really bad idea. Because we know that he should know that it's a really bad idea, don't we? It's barely a week since Moses shared with them God's top ten of what to do and what not to do. And coming right in there at number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Barely a week previously. And yet, not only do the people suggest it, Aaron goes along with it, and we might wonder what on earth he was thinking. Because he's complicit in helping the people to create the golden calf, a symbol of youth, strength, and virility, with which to replace Yahweh, the Lord who has brought them out of Egypt, a lifeless lump of metal in place of the living God who has protected them and provided for them at every turn. Why on earth would this have seemed like a good idea to them? Well, it's partly because all of the cultures around them made physical representations of their gods. That was what they were used to seeing. But it's also partly, I think, because in Moses' absence, they panicked. With Moses gone, they had no one to reassure them that Yahweh was still with them, still on their side. And they haven't come far enough yet in that relationship with God to be able to trust it for themselves. They want something tangible, something that they can touch and hold and point to and say this, this is the God who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Not this hide-and-seek God who appears in pillars of cloud and fire on the horizon. The thing is, though, can we really blame them? Their lives have been turned upside down in the past few months. They're still not in a place where they feel settled and secure. 
Who wouldn't want a God that they can see at all times and hold on to like a talisman or a security blanket? We're far from immune to the same temptation. And it's worth asking ourselves from time to time what our golden calves are. What are the tangible things that we've reached for in times when we've felt at a loss and wondered where God is? What have we put in God's place to make ourselves feel better? The thing is that often the things that people try to put in God's place, things like possessions or food or alcohol, not only doesn't do us any good, like the golden calf, but they can actually do us harm. But the biggest harm that it does is falsely filling that need for God in our lives. What the Israelites really needed was Yahweh, God. But instead of doing the hard work of seeking him, they took the easy option and ended up with something much less satisfying. I do believe that, to a large extent, our God is a hide-and-seek God. He's not always obviously right there in front of us. We have to look for glimpses of him, follow the clues. And that's what makes a relationship with God interesting. It's also what makes it faith, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. But at the same time, He's never far away from us, never too far to hear us when we call for help, never too far to run and catch us when we're falling. And let's face it, golden calves can't do that. But there's another aspect of this story that I want to touch on briefly, and that's the nature of leadership. Because in this story, we see two very different models of leadership as enacted by Aaron and Moses. And Aaron, in this passage, shows himself to be a weak leader, easily intimidated and swayed by the people into acting in a way he knows to be wrong. Leaders certainly need to listen to their people and respond to their needs, but not by simply giving them whatever it is that they want. Often what people really need is very different to what they think they want. Aaron didn't listen to the words behind the words closely enough to understand that what the people really needed was reassurance and to know that someone was in charge in Moses' absence. Moses, on the other hand, despite his initial reluctance to lead, I refer you back to the scene at the burning bush and all the excuses that he made, including, oh, please, God, send someone else. Despite all of that, Moses shows himself to be a strong and fearless leader, going into bat for his people against an extremely angry God and ultimately persuading him to change his mind. Being in a position of leadership is not easy. And I know that many of you will know that from your professional lives and from personal experience. Leaders are far from being infallible. And those who believe that they are, are often the ones who cause great harm. Leaders need support from those they lead and the teams that they build around themselves. But they also need to be held accountable for their actions and their decisions. That's why in the Church of England we have the structure that we have of synods and PCCs. And the role of the PCC is not simply to rubber stamp the incumbent's decisions, but to listen critically and ask the hard questions so that everyone can be confident that what's agreed on is in line with the whole mission of the church in the parish. I will regret saying this at the next PCC meeting when you start asking me hard questions. But no, I welcome it. I really do, honestly. But anyway, over the past few years, some very hard questions have been asked of the Church of England in relation to its handling of historic allegations of sexual abuse. And the conclusions of that inquiry published this week have been fairly damning. They've said that there have been fa serious failings in safeguarding and in how allegations of abuse have been handled. 
And it's right and proper that the church authorities have been held to account over these failures. There's a real need for repentance and for restitution. There's also a responsibility of, at all levels of the church to learn from the things that have gone wrong and to do everything possible to make sure that the culture changes and that any future allegations are handled sensitively but thoroughly in a way that's fair for both the victim and the accused. There's a tendency in our national discourse and particularly on social media not to let individuals and institutions move on from something like this. And we can't and shouldn't deny that the Church of England has suffered serious reputational damage in the eyes of the nation. And that's going to overshadow for a long time to come so much of the good work that the Church does. There's a lot of hard work ahead to rehabilitate the image of the Church of England. The good news, if there is any good news in all of this, is that even when leaders fail, as Aaron does so comprehensively, ours is a God who believes in second chances. By God's grace, Aaron went on to be the high priest of Israel despite his failures. So by God's grace, may those in authority in our church, our archbishops and bishops, clergy and people in authority at all levels, be given the time and wisdom to put things right for the present and for the future. And by God's grace, may we seek God's face in everything that we do and not be tempted to grasp at shortcuts and easy answers, but do the hard work of kingdom building in our church, our community and in the world. Amen. We're now going to declare our faith in the words of the Creed on page five in your booklets. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So we're going to sit now as we turn to prayer for the world. Let us pray for the church and for the world and let us thank God for his goodness. Lord, though we often find the world to be a frightening place, 
that drains our hope, stultifies our joy and robs us of our peace. We rejoice in the promise that in the midst of the storm, everyone who stands close to you will find freedom and security, peace and protection. Lord, we have come to thank you for being present when we are tempted, strong enough to hold us up when we are falling, and loving enough to stand by us, forgiving us and helping us to begin again. We bring our prayers in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy. For confirmation of some of God's promises, I would encourage you to read Psalm 91. Father, we pray for your church. There are times when we lose our way and in danger of losing our hold on you. Give your church faith to believe, hope to reach out, and love to make it real. Rekindle our faith in the promise given to us in the Bible, that all tears will be wiped away, and death, sadness, crying and pain will cease, through the power of your word in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, and all leaders of people. We pray for those involved in the government of their country and for those who carry burdens of care, compassion, and healing. We pray especially for those with difficult decisions to make and for those seeking to bring peace and harmony to a broken world. For those who know you and for those who do not, that they may be channels of your reconciling grace for all. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we come to you because you are strength for us when our strength fails. You are hope for us when hope is gone. You are love for us when we are cold and empty. You are forgiveness for us when we go wrong. You are peace for us when we are afraid. You are beginning again when it feels like the end. And so, Father, we lift to you this morning the petitions on our prayer tree and ask you to draw close to those who are in need of your loving touch. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we come to thank you for who you are and what you have done, that in Christ you lift us when we are down, you heal us when we are hurting, and you hold us when we are broken, you strengthen us when we are weak. We thank you for your love which will never be defeated, and your purposes will never end. We pray this morning for Olive Murray, Margaret Nicholson's mum, Lawrence Britton, and Audrey Morn. And let us take a moment to remember before our Lord anyone who we know who was in need of his touch. <coughs> May they all know the support of your presence and find wholeness and peace in your love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we bring before you this morning our church members who are unable to attend church regularly, and we name before you Mavis Teasdale, June Atkinson, Una Middleton, Carol Campbell Graham, Phyllis Beatty, Pat Rutter, Ron and Mary Snow, Mary Jobson, Edna Dawson, Harry Robinson, Mary Dixon, and John Morn. We thank you for the peace and security of our homes. We thank you for the stillness and that you speak to us through the silence. We rejoice in your abiding presence. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of hope and giver of all comfort, we ask you to draw close to the family and friends of June Kirby who died recently. Give them the peace that passes all understanding and help them know that neither death nor life can separate them from your love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we are so highly favoured. Your love met us at our birth and has come with us on the journey of our lives to this moment in time. Your love goes before us, preparing the way. Your love is with us from this day on. So often the future appears dark, empty and uncertain. We do not know what tomorrow will bring, but we trust that through the darkest hour, your light will show the way through the most fearful day. 
until that time when we enter the light of the knowledge of your love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, Judith. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Thank you. Do exchange the sign of the peace with one another as best you can without uh, running around the building. Fear I may have just done that thing I said at the beginning I had to be careful not to and hummed over the microphone during that. So sorry if you uh, heard random humming there. Be present, be present. Lord Jesus Christ, our risen High Priest, make yourself known in the breaking of bread. Amen. Amen. The Lord is here. Is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of Hilda and all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Because our young church haven't joined us yet, we're going to leave the Lord's Prayer until after communion so that they can join in the Lord's Prayer with us. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you but only say the word, and I shall be healed. body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for us all, keep our bodies and souls in eternal life. Amen.
as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We praise and thank you, O Christ, for this sacred feast. For here we receive you. Here the memory of your passion is renewed. Here our minds are filled with grace. And here a pledge of future glory is given, when we shall feast at that table where you reign with all your saints forever. Amen. And we say together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before we bring our service to a close this morning. Firstly, to say that we had a successful annual meeting on Thursday evening. Um, we've duly elected people to the PCC, and I'm very pleased to say that um, we've elected Sue McGinn uh, to be our church warden as Joan is stepping down. So it's really wonderful to have Sue stepping into, stepping into big shoes, I think, to fill. But um, Sue, where are you, Sue? Wave at me. Oh, she's, hide she's hiding behind the, uh, the lectern. Uh, yes, Sue, we're, uh, we will all support you in every way we can. We're delighted that you've taken that on. And thank you also to those who've agreed to stand again for the PCC. I wanted to wave this at you. Hopefully you will all have received one of these with your magazine. This is our um, Christmas mail order catalogue. Um, in view of the fact that we obviously, due to the current situation, we can't have a Christmas fair this year. Um, but unfortunately that doesn't negate the need for fundraising for the church. And this is a really brilliant idea. Thank you to Fran and Maureen and everyone who's worked really hard to put this together. Um, do please, if you haven't got one, get hold of one and um, support it in all the ways you can. There's some lovely little gifts in there um, for friends and family. And if there's anybody else that you know around the doors that you think would like to have one of these to buy things from, then do please spread the word. Um, I think that's a really super initiative. A huge thank you to those who've organised it and those who are going to be very busy in the next few months making the things to give to people. Um, I also just wanted to very briefly uh, draw your attention to the fact that I know, you know, every now and again we have these world whatever days, but yesterday, October the 10th, is, was World Mental Health Day, and I know I'm a day late, but it feels important to highlight this anyway because you probably all have heard the statistics that one in four people at any given time um, is being treated for depression. I think it's so closer to one in three who are having difficulties with anxiety, particularly at this time when everything's so uncertain. It's, we're not, none of us are immune to it. There could be any, you know, any of us might be feeling a little bit wobbly and, and um, sort of struggling a bit with our, with our mental health, or you may know people who are. So there's some posters that are, have gone up on the board at the back. Um, 10 keys to a happier life. Oh, 10 keys to happier living, not to a happier life. That would be a bit, um, that would be a bit uh, fairy godmother, wouldn't it? And a, a weekly wellbeing checkup. Do have a look at those. Um, and as I say, if there's anybody else that you know that you're kind of watching and thinking, oh, I'm not sure how well they're doing, then do direct them to some of them. There's loads and loads of help and information out there. So do please try and kind of guide people in the direction of some of that if you think that they need it. And just finally to, uh, I know I'm like your granny or something or your mother, but just one final reminder that of course we do still need to be really careful with our, uh, you know, I've lost count of where we're up to with the government, whether it's face, space, 
can't remember what it is, but anyway. But we really do need to, uh, to just keep on top of that, make sure that we give one another space as we come in and out of church. And please, I know we want to be able to hang around and chat to people, but unfortunately we can't really do that at the moment. So please, if you would leave the building promptly and, uh, and disperse promptly as well and use the phone to ring each other up and uh, check in on each other because we do need to still do that at this time. I'll stop nagging now, shall I? Was there anything else that I needed to say notice-wise? Nobody waving at me. Oh, next Sunday is our Harvest Festival. So it will be uh, an all-age service of the word. Um, if you would like to receive communion that morning, there will be a communion service at St Paul's at 8.45. Do please let us know if you're planning to attend because we're getting a bit tight on the numbers. But there will be a communion service at 8.45 over in Winlayton next Sunday morning. But if you can, do come and support our Harvest uh, Festival. We're gathering non-perishable food items only, so cans, boxes, tins, jars, to go to the People's Kitchen. Uh, so do please uh, give generously if you can. I think we're going to uh, gather our gifts around the font, so just as you come in next Sunday, if you place any gifts that you've brought around the font, and that sort of relieves the need to multiple people to, to handle them that'll be great but i'm sure it's going to be a fun service next sunday i can't think of anything else that i should tell you at this moment in time so i'll stop waffling and instead we'll have our blessing would you like to stand with me the peace of god which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of god and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and on all those you love, this day and always. Amen. Amen. So let us go in peace, keeping a safe distance, to love and to serve the Lord, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.